So it's great to be here. It's great to see a room full of um, product managers, and it's good to actually be one again. Um, I think for I've given a couple talks over the past few years from stuff I've learned through my experience at you know from from early companies, and it you know after investing for a long time, I decided to go realize how much I was missing just getting to build things. So I'm I'm excited to be back in it, and um, you know I think today I'm going to talk a little bit about metrics and like how to think about metrics and and really you know when I'm both been looking at companies as an investor and also working. This is some of the stuff that we did, particularly when I joined Twitter. Um, it was like, how do we actually figure out what products really matter and what products, you know, what metrics we can use to really define how we go and do product development from there. You know, so I like to think about it is we all start in a world where we're trying to build products that matter. And we want to build products that people use habitually and meaningfully in their lives to, to solve real problems for them. And I like to remind people, like, all products start from a pretty crappy state. If you remember, that's the very first Whole Foods in Austin, Texas, before it became this you know, conglomerate that Amazon just bought. That is you know, Google's very first web page, which had a lot of text on it. There's a little bouncing um, thing on the screen. There's, you know, the very first Facebook was uh, incredibly simple and didn't have anything like the Facebook that we know today that is changing the world and elections and governments. Um, you know, <laughs> and then even LinkedIn, which I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit, you know, you know, we forget that now it's a professional network with over 500 million people, and it started out with this crazy web 2.0, two-column format with yellow and, and, and blue columns, just to make it work, and, and, and it always starts somewhere, and, and we only do these things. People only work at these companies, work on these products, at least I do, because we really want to make an impact on our users' lives, and we think we can build technology that can actually build and, and bring them much better solutions. And so every product that I've ever worked on, every feature even, I'm sure this is true for most of you, it always starts with a launch. What you have to remember is before you launch, you have zero users of that thing. And whether it's a launching a whole new product, whether it's launching a company, whether it's just launching a new feature within your existing product, you have zero people. And so hopefully, you figure out how to get them to come or you figure out how to bring them into your product. And this is really the secret to product development is what things can we build that attract people to want to use our products and what things can we do to help them grow. And so as you first launch this, you hustle, you go out there, you try to get people using it, and you start hearing stories. And you start hearing kind of these anecdotes. And you start like hearing from the very first user who used it. And you're like, why did you use it? And they're like, I don't know, it was pretty interesting. I had this great experience, or I had a bad experience. Um, I tried it, it didn't work for me. Or I tried it, and it did. And then this stuff adds up. And, and, and we like to like look at data. And I'm sure we're a, product, a room full of product managers. Everybody's looking at data and dashboards all the time. But it's very important to remember that the plural of, or data is the plural of anecdote. Because if you actually think about it, when you're looking at a conversion rate of 30%, that means 70 out of 100 people, 70 people tried your product and failed to find something that delivered value in their lives that got them over that hurdle. And 30%, 30 of those individuals did. And each individual is having their very own life story. They're sitting there, if it's a mobile app, they're on their phone, they're trying something. They're like, ah, this didn't work for me. They're shutting down the app and they're launching another app because they're bored or they were waiting in line and someone just distracted them or they were trying your app and then they got a phone call. Like those are the actual little things that are these real stories that matter that turn into data. And it's so easy to get confused by data. So I always like to remind people to like, if you aren't doing enough user research and enough interviews to come back to those anecdotes, you won't actually ever have the data start to make sense. But once you are and you start talking about the data, like it can then get overwhelming. And you start to go, oh my gosh, what do I actually look at? Where do I actually sort through all this data to figure out what really matters from those stories? And how do I turn that data back into stories that matter? Um, you know, as a VC over the past six years, I've seen a lot of these data points come through. And I get people who will come through and bring me their data and they'll say, is this thing working? We just had 200,000 signups. I'm like, I don't know if that's working unless they're actually using the product. We have a million downloads. We had 250 million paid views. Our D7 retention is 60%. Our D30 is 22% a 50% down mal ratio. We can go on and on, and I'm sure we all have benchmarks, and I'm sure we all look and compare ourselves to the ratios and the numbers that we think other companies have, but it's really hard to know what actually applies to your product. And so like, I always start with people, and I'm like, okay, back up. Let's think about what we're really trying to solve for here and what your product is actually about. And then I just ask people this very simple question. Are people using your product? And then they look at me often, sometimes with a blank stare. And they're like, well, um, I think so, because you know, I have this great down mal ratio. Or look at my D7. And I'm like, OK, but that doesn't actually matter. Are they having stories in their lives where your product really matters? And so 
what does it actually mean to really start digging into this? You know, the, the first thing I like to say is like the purpose. Like, what is that need? What is that? that some people call it a job to be done. Um, but what is that need in their life? Like, why do they pick up your product and use it? Why do they pull out their phone or when they're already on their phone, open your app or go to your website or drive to your business to actually use it? What is that need that you're solving? And then the core action. What is the, what I like to call the key behavior? What is that that thing that they do when they're actually using your product where they're like, okay, I had a satisfactory experience. Um, and then the cycle. What is the frequency at which you expect? And it's very important for your own product for you to have a good theory of what these things are. You know, I'm learning this a lot as I, I enter Robinhood and I'm realizing like the product of Robinhood is not a trading product because we don't expect people to trade stocks every day. In fact, if you're doing that, you could be a day trader that might actually be a healthy way to invest, but it is to, to actually invest. And I think understanding that cycle at which you expect someone to engage with your product in various actions is incredibly important. And if you then math this all out to an actual key metric, you actually can develop one, which is how many times users perform the core action on the expected cycle. And so if you actually make that your real metric that you're going to watch for, you can actually start to build back up, like, are people using your product and what that means, what you can determine from the data and the interviews. So it's easier to explain this by example instead of just, uh, um, you know, and to show kind of how different products work rather than just, um, you know, talking about it conceptually. So I'll kind of go through five examples here that I think are helpful to think about sort of that cycle. So the first is LinkedIn. And this is what LinkedIn looked like in 2005. I was there. The company was, was tiny, and we were trying to get everybody on their professional network. We had state-of-the-art design with lots of colors. And, and like this button up here, it says add connections because inviting was a really important behavior on LinkedIn. Like we would turn it more and more red and we'd get more and more clicks and it like totally worked. So like if, like it's the worst case example of like make the button red that I've ever experienced in my career. Um, but like what was important with LinkedIn that people don't understand is LinkedIn had two purposes and it was for very different sets of people. The first purpose of LinkedIn is finding other people who you want to connect with. And like, if I'm a recruiter, if I'm a business development person, if I'm a salesperson, that is a, at least a couple time a week activity. So we would, we would think that you were really using LinkedIn if you were in those needs, where you were actually searching on LinkedIn a couple times a week. But for most, how many people here use LinkedIn a couple times a week? Oh, that's a lot in this room. But you're like product managers and hiring and founders and everybody else. So like, so like that is not true when we go like out to much more of the rest of the world. Um, for most people, the real purpose of being on LinkedIn was to be found. And so it actually wasn't about this constant usage, but what really mattered to LinkedIn is we had to get you in the network, we had to get your profile updated properly, we had to make sure that you would respond to inquiries if they would come to you, we had to make sure that you would be open to keep building up your network. So for most of those users, we were not actually tracking metrics on like daily or cyclical use, we were just making sure that they were valid in the system and their email address was valid, it didn't bounce back to us. And that was really important. And LinkedIn's gotten to 500 million or plus people or something like all through this kind of growth by understanding that there's a small group of people who have very active usage, but everybody else is very valuable to the network as long as they'll respond to inquiries. And once you start thinking about it like that, you realize getting you onboarded doesn't mean get you to a habitual use, but get you to understand that when something comes in, it could be so valuable to you that of course you want to have a LinkedIn account and of course you want to get all your friends on it too. So then I think of a product like Yelp. So how many people use Yelp every day? Okay, it's like very few of you because like Yelp is not really an everyday need. I mean, it's to find local businesses and services around you. My assumption with Yelp is it's one, two, maybe three times a week at most that people really would need to use Yelp. But if you're a user of Yelp, you should be using it you know, at least once or twice a week. And if they're tracking you on some metric standpoint, if you're not using it every week or two, then you're probably getting these needs elsewhere, Google or uh, you know, Foursquare or other different search engines. And so you really, again, think about like a weekly habit in Yelp's case is totally fine. Um, whereas in the case of, of, of other products, you want more of that daily habit. And then reviewers, you know, they want somebody reviews on some frequency or maybe they just get you to write a whole bunch of reviews at once. And it's important, again, think about like what is that use case, that cycle in which somebody's doing it that's very, very different. So, you know, then, then it comes to Facebook, which I think we all know that Facebook as the kind of addictive engagement, staying connected with your friends, they have figured out how to make something that's like a daily use product, maybe even an hourly use product, um, to like stay in touch with your friends and the people that you care about. And they really have pioneered a lot of these DAU metrics, Dow Mao. They're like, look, we have 60% of our, you know, uh, Dow Mao, and like it's, you know, we get notifications. We know how to bring people in all the time. And I think in some ways they've kind of misset the bar 
Because a lot of companies aspire to like, how do I have metrics like Facebook? And you don't need to to have a very, very good business. Facebook only works as their business because they have people on there so much that they get room to show them advertising. But every little advertising impression doesn't actually make them much money. Versus in Yelp, one search makes Yelp a lot more money. In LinkedIn, just being findable makes LinkedIn a lot of money. So you can think about that it actually maps back to business model as well as when you understand if people are really using your product. But the business model conversation honestly is a Whole, could be a whole separate talk. So that's probably the, the last I'll focus on that. Um, does anybody here know Discord? It's a company I invested, I'm on the board of. That was not too many people. None of you play League of Legends or Overwatch or, or, or other uh, PUBG or Fortnite or anything. Um, but if you do, then Discord has actually rapidly become one of the very largest platforms for people to communicate and connect with their friends around playing PC games. And so when we think of the metrics for Discord, we don't really think about like, hey, are you using Discord every day to talk to your friends? We're saying, whenever you're playing a game on your PC, you should be using Discord to communicate with the people that you're playing with. And so we really look for high correlation with how much you're playing games. If you're a weekly gamer, totally cool if you're using Discord every week. If you're a daily gamer, we want you to be using Discord daily. But we don't necessarily say, hey, you're not gaming today. Why aren't you using Discord? How do we you know, message you or, or do other things to get you to be using Discord. And so that's a really important way that we're kind of correlating it to extrinsic real world behavior and thinking about that as our metric that matters. You know, and then the last one I'd like to bring up is Airbnb. And I know you're gonna have some talks later today from, from people who've been building Airbnb. But like Airbnb is not a daily habit, a weekly habit, or even a monthly habit product really. Their goal is that whenever you're taking a trip, and you're thinking about where to go, you should be using Airbnb to find better lodging, a better, much more local experience, a place that you can stay that's better than some, some hotel. Greylock's an, an investor in Airbnb. And so like, I like to think about Airbnb as like, how do you get somebody on that cycle of three to five times a year? And that's actually a very, very different challenge than most of what we talk about for like, getting people into a daily habit. You have to be top of mind. You have to make sure the brand is very present so that when people do start their travel search, they remember to go to you first. But again, each, you know, it, it's a very lucrative activity. When somebody actually books and, and rents a room on Airbnb, that's a great transaction for the host as well as for the company. And so it's important to think about like, that cycle works great for Airbnb's business and it's very, very different than Facebook's. So no metrics apply to all companies. You have to do a really good job finding the metrics and the cycle and the pattern that really applies to yours. And then what you wanna figure out is who are these users who really get your product? And because if you can understand who these users are, then you can start to go, okay, I got some. How do I get everybody else to be like that? And so your core users really are your best users. The first thing that I'd say is, is these are the users who come top of, um, via top of mind. They open up your product and they come to it. They don't open Google and like, oh, I want to find hotels in, in you know, Paris. Oh, look, there's an Airbnb. They're like, I'm just going to go to Airbnb and search for Paris. They're like, what's up with my friends? They open the Facebook app on their phone. They're like, I'm going to go play games. I open up Discord on my computer. Like that's top of mind, not because of SEO or a coupon or a notification or some other trigger. The second thing is they're recurring users. They come back again and again and again and again. On that cycle, so it doesn't necessarily need to be more than the cycle, but you just keep seeing them top of mind again and again. And the last is referring. Your very, very best users will refer your product to other people and engage them to use it too. And people say, oh my gosh, can you actually track these things? And I like to encourage people to track them um, as close as you can. In terms of top of mind, you can actually track it by understanding what your direct traffic and engagement is, how many people are opening your app versus coming because of a notification or an email click or a SEO link that went to your product or something else. In terms of recurring, you should have a great separation where you can actually look at your bucket of users who you believe are on this regular cycle and separate them from the users who you don't know if they are so that when you're looking at your dashboards, you actually have a sense of which are recurring and which aren't. And then in terms of referring, you can get a pretty good sense of which are your users. You want to understand your overall K factor, which is virality, which we can talk about um, separately as well, or understanding kind of which of your users really are referrers and are coming back on that frequent basis. So kind of as you think about who your core users are, as you think about what the cycle is, then you want to go, okay, are people really, really, really using my product? Do they get it? Are they on some cadence that matters? And so here's an exercise that we did um, when I walked into Twitter um, to really kind of figure out what is that sticky point at which we know that they're a healthy user. And, and again, this was for Twitter, which I expected to be closer to a daily habit product than something else. So if you were going to do this over something, you know, another product, you might have to do quarterly by quarter or like half year by half year to really figure out your patterns. Um, but at Twitter, we went through the question. We said, who's sticky and who's not? 
Who do we think is actually getting to the point where their Twitter accounts are set up well enough that they're coming back regularly and which ones aren't? And so we did this whole chart, um, which we analyzed month over month usage. And basically the x-axis is the number of days that they visited in one month. And then the y-axis is the percent of those people who visited this, um, that many days in the second month. And so we were able to just model this over the whole user base of people who had been on the product at least 60 days. And then we charted it. And we basically just drew a line that said, if you've used it at least this many days in the next month, what do you do? And as we charted this, it actually had this really interesting thing around s between seven and eight days, which is if you use Twitter about seven or eight days in a month, you were over 90% likely to keep using it in the next month. And we realized that like, that was about twice a week. And, and so at this point in our analysis, and this was like, you know, this was 2010, so this feels like ancient history now. But we were trying to figure out who was sticky and who wasn't because the whole world had heard of Twitter and what wasn't actually using it. We found that this number actually like, really helped us. We're like, okay, once somebody starts using it twice a week, it's already habitual in their lives. How do we get them maybe? We want to get those people up to using it almost every day. But really, we just have a gap, which is either you get there or you're likely to fall off the face of the earth and not, not become a real user of Twitter. And so um, we, we started, sorry, that, sorry for this typo in Google Slides, but um, we started translating these buckets and we realized, look, if you got to like eight days a month, we called you a core user and said, you've habitually got Twitter in your life. If you were using it kind of one to seven days, we called you a casual user, which meant you haven't quite gotten sticky at Twitter. And then if you're using it kind of like one day in the first month and likely to fall off and not come back the second month, we called you comatose or, or cold and just realized like we didn't have, you had not found your meaning in Twitter for us to give you enough value that you were going to keep coming back. And so then we modeled what the transitions were. So I made these three buckets. Then we said, okay, how many of our people who are kind of checking out Twitter or signing up, we, we put them in the new user bucket when they first signed up because we didn't know how sticky they would be yet. How many of them actually transitioned to each one of these groups after they signed up? And so by doing this, I call this the kite diagram because it kind of looks like a kite that you're flying sideways maybe. Um, I think mine had more angular, so it wasn't as, as beautiful as this. Um, but we call this a kite diagram, and we really try to understand what the transitions were. You know, we found this interesting thing. This is, again, data from early Twitter, which is if you were a core user, you were 90% likely to, um, you know, over 90% to keep staying in the core bucket. A few people would fall into the casual bucket. A few people would fall into the uh, cold bucket. But um, what was really interesting to us was from new users, only 20% of the people became core. So we had a real gap. We were getting all these people to sign up for Twitter. 40% of them were in their second month were just falling into cold bucket. 40% of them were kind of ending up in casual, at which point 50% of them ended up in the cold bucket. And very few actually transitioned back up to core. So we said, okay, we just have a new user problem. Like when we analyze this, we don't even get enough people to become core users. So that was growing because those were a very, very sticky set of people, but not at the rate that the company was or the profile was. And then we went to kind of understand why, and we did two exercises to do this. The first is we looked at our data. And we did go to our data and we said, what's different about those users who become core and who don't? And the first thing we figured out was the users who became core were more likely to follow more than 30 accounts, which meant, you know, and you can call that causation or correlation, but at some level they were interested enough in Twitter, they were finding enough accounts to follow that Twitter became valuable to them. The second thing we found is that they had a one-third, two-thirds ratio of following. So about two-thirds of the people they followed did not follow them back, but about one-third of the ones who they followed followed them back um, in the kind of the healthiest accounts or the healthiest account states. And to us, what, that, what we then interpreted that to mean was, okay, if you find a few friends on the system who will follow you back and you can start to have some engagement with them, but most of the people you follow are people you don't know that you're interested in getting information from them, that might be a really healthy mix. So how do we then design the product to help people them, um, who don't necessarily have the tools and the wherewithal to get there themselves, help them get to that healthy mix? But the second thing we did um, was to actually validate this just by talking to users. And we did this whole exercise where we found a bunch of users, I called them bounce back users, who had signed up, left, came back, and then got sticky. Um, we found that group of people and interviewed them. And I found that that was a great group to interview because they were much more articulate about the journey that they had gone on than people who had like signed up and left. What, why did you sign up? Why, didn't you, why did you not get it? They couldn't quite explain it that well. And if you just get people who signed up and like loved your product, they weren't as useful either because they hadn't been through a kind of a journey of learning. So we asked this group four questions. Um, what prompted you to sign up and try it out in the first place? What didn't meet your expectations or it was hard to figure out? What was the trigger that actually caused you to come back and give it another shot? And then 
once you came back that second time, what changed in either your mindset or in the product that helped you get to that healthy state? For Twitter, it was actually really simple. We found out that people heard about Twitter for tweeting, and then they realized that um, actually, it was, like, but like, they didn't know what to say. So they would kind of like follow some random people or get shoved random people to follow, and then they'd bail. And then they would hear later, my pastor, my favorite food truck, my favorite celebrity, this interesting you know, thing I can follow the news, the president is on Twitter, um, and they would want to come back and say, oh, Twitter's really about finding and following these things and listening and understanding it. And so the second time, they would kind of be more curious and find more things they were interested in and then get sticky. Now, this was still a smaller set of the users than we wanted. We had to do a whole bunch of feature work in order to drive the rest of it, but it, but it really did help. And so those people, the ones who get through that journey, who become sticky, like these are your core users, they're your superheroes, like everything you should be doing as a product manager is trying to get in their heads, understand what's valuable to them, and figure as a growth PM, it's like how do I get more people to that same place that those users are? You know, and as a, if you're building other features into your product, it's how do I build more things that will cause more people to become core users if my current product offering isn't robust enough to do that. So once you get a few core users, the next thing you want is more. And you're like, how do I get more of them? So there's always a couple ways to approach this problem, and they're very, very different depending on what problems you have. The first is not enough people show up. So if you're in a state where you're not just getting enough people to your front door every day, you've got to work on that. The first thing I like to spend time on is virality. I think there's a, there's a lot of ways to, um, to be more viral and to make your product viral. Um, and you can actually own this yourself. The first is just word of mouth. There's a lot of things you can do to make it easier for people to talk about your product and share it with other people. The second thing is what I call demonstration virality, which is like, what moments can you create in your product that's like, that's so cool, how did you do that? You know, I remember the first time that an Uber drove up and my friend had ordered an Uber. And we were like walking out of the office and he like got in a black car and I was like, how did you do that, sorcery? And like, it was an incredible way to like be discover Uber. And every time you would do that for a while, then I would like finally, oh, I just need to start you know, writing an Uber. And again, this is back in like 2010. You know, and then the last is infectious virality, which is invitations. Please come join me on this product. It'll make both of our products better. And those work when you have social features or network features where actually bringing other people in makes it useful for both. Um, so the second piece of the, the pie is like, Okay, you're getting a bunch of people to sign up, but nobody's sticking around. Now you can say, maybe my product's not very good, but I actually think the problem isn't usually the product, but the onboarding. And so as a, as a product manager, you really want to think about onboarding. Starts at the very beginning when somebody signs up, gets them all the way to that habitual cycle and state. And if you're not focused on that entire journey and helping people to do that, you're not going to ever get your, your onboarding right. So the first thing I think about is like, the onboarding flows really matter. I call it the learn flow, not the onboarding flow. Because what you really want to do is get somebody to learn your product enough so that I like to do, like if you're doing user research, at the end of a, a usability test on your onboarding flow, you should be able to ask them, what do you think the product does? And they should have a pretty good answer. Because the, the learning flow, the teaching flow, should have actually taken through enough of the steps to do it. Those little tours where you just like swipe, swipe through the product, like those don't teach anybody because nobody reads that stuff. It's really a set of steps where at every little step people take an action and they learn, and, and you know, I can talk forever about how we did it at Twitter, and, and honestly, this is some of the work that I'm already thinking about in my new role. Um, Musical.ly is a company that I invested in that I think does this actually pretty well. It shows off what the product does, helps people create their own list of content that they follow, encourages them to engage and participate, and one in four users on Musical.ly create content every day. So they've done a good job kind of getting people to participate, and then it delivers them into the product. Um, the, the last thing is, don't just think about your onboarding flow as one day. Think about it as you got a week, maybe two. If somebody new shows up to your service, you got maybe one or two weeks in which you can pull them in, bring them back to the product, use emails or messages or push notifications to try to lure them back to take other steps, and think about what the steps are you would have somebody take over days. Um, I do kind of think if you didn't get somebody in the first week or two, like you probably didn't really get them, and you probably have to do a bunch of work to reacquire them later. But you also don't have to think about it as all, all your work needs to be in the first session either. Um, this is a company called Ritual that Greylock's invested in that does an incredible job. It creates a way for groups to order lunch together um, at an office and just has a really good loop that sort of pulls people in over that week. Because when you first sign up for it, you might not order food that day, but their, their goal is to get you to actually order food within that week. You know, and then the last thing is social pressure. How do you use all your existing users to nudge other people to come onto the product? Um, the last problem is, so you've done all this work, you think you've got your users, they come, they actually have a really good month or two, but then they sort of peter out over time. Well, this just means that you just got to move the, the goalpost forward. 
You got like if you've done all your analysis over a month or two, but then everybody's petering out, which is like pretty normal, for example, in a game, which we don't expect to have these really long-term patterns. Um, but on a product like you know most of the products that I assume you guys build or products that I've worked on, you really do think that these these user lifetimes are, are lifetimes. You know, I people Facebook expects you to be using it 10 years later, 20 years later. Google, I'm still searching it. You know. 18 years after the first time I did a Google search. And so you do need to extend your window to make sure that you're really seeing the patterns that you want if you're seeing people peter out over time. So if you just go back and think about your own products and like how you're going to build features and how you're going to drive more people into it, like make sure that you're focused on the right North Star, the key metric, which is just how many people are really using your product. Cool. Thank you.